for joining um, for today's event, which um, is the first kind of public event that accompanies Beyond Metaphor, Women and War. And just before I introduce our two speakers, I will say a few words about the exhibition itself, which, as Abby has mentioned, uh, is a group show, which includes the work of five contemporary artists, Marwa Arsanios, Kader Atia, Katia Kameli, Nadja Mahlouf and Zineb Sedira, all of whom explore through different media women's experiences during the Algerian War of Independence. And the war, as many of you might know, was fought between 1954 and 62 and ended the long French colonial rule in Algeria. All of the artworks in the exhibition um, offer a lens through which we can re-examine as well as potentially reimagine the intersections between gender and decolonization. And it is this the relationship that stands at the core of the exhibition and its idea. Generally speaking, um, histories of decolonization have foregrounded the role of men in challenging colonial rule, as well as in, in the subsequent building of post-colonial states. And in the rare instances when women are evoked, they very often figure as symbols of a collective and sacrificial struggle against colonialism, which of course reveals very little about how women lived through the war and their distinct experiences. The works shown in the IPEX art exhibition, as well as in its um, online version, attend to women's multiple roles during the war as fighters, nurses, community organizers, educa educators, and civilians during decolonization. They also confront the visual trope of the Algerian woman fighter that has emerged and is quite current and engage with the broader processes that turn women into symbols of sacrifice, suffering, and national unity. So given the focus of the show, it was um, immediately clear to us that we would like to invite Natalia Vince, um, who has researched women's histories in Algeria for over 15 years now. Natalia is a reader in North African studies at the University of Portsmouth in the south of the UK and author of a book titled Our Fighting Sisters, Nation, Memory and Gender in Algeria, 1954 to 2012, which was published um, in 2015. And the publication, which is incredibly well researched and also written in a very accessible way, won the Women's History Network Book Prize in 2016. Last year, she published another book uh, titled The Algerian War, The Algerian Revolution, which offers new perspectives on the histories of the war as well as on its historiographies. Natalia is also co-creator of the ongoing trilingual documentary project titled Generation Independence, a people's history of Algeria in the 1960s and 1970s, which is based on oral history and explores the role of students and graduates in the construction of the post-independence Algerian state. And I also encourage you to go on the website of Generation Independence because it includes some really fascinating um, documentaries. So following her talk, Natalia will be in conversation with Arthur Asaraf, um, who is a historian of modern France, North Africa, and the Mediterranean, with particular interest in the history of colonialism and information. He is also lecturer in the history of France and the Francophone world at the University of Cambridge. And in 2019, he published his first book titled Electric News in Colonial Algeria, which won the Middle East Studies Book Prize, and which is really a fascinating read. Um, as well. And he is a regular commentator on French and North African news for radio and online media. So I will um, end the introductions here. Thank you again both for being with us um, on a Saturday. And I will now hand over to you, Natalia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kazia, for that introduction, for this invitation, for putting together this wonderful exhibition. Um, thank you to Abby and to Apex Art for hosting it. And thank you uh, to Arthur for, for doing the conversation bit and knowing Arthur, I'm sure he's going to ask me some really difficult um, questions. Um, I'm going to uh, share some slides, which is always a bit embarrassing uh, and awkward uh, when you're speaking at an art exhibition, because obviously I'm not an artist. Uh, these are my PowerPoint slides, which, which very much are those of a university lecturer. Um, and there's just a few images on them. They're sort of illustrative uh, uh, more than anything else. Um, but just to sort of talk us through sort of some of the, the key questions, really, that I'd like to, to raise with you this evening or, or at lunchtime, uh, wherever um, you're joining us from. I'll just close that down there. Okay, so in this talk, 
Um, I'm interested in exploring how women's participation in the Algerian War of Independence has been talked about and represented uh, both at the time and subsequently um, by women themselves, uh, by the Algerian nationalist movement, uh, by the post-independence Algerian state, by feminist movements in Algeria, and by a range of other actors. And the question that I'm particularly interested in is the political and social purposes which the production of a certain set of stories about women's participation in the war serve and how these stories, which are constructed for political purposes, economic purposes, social purposes, how they intersect with women's lived experiences in wartime. So what do we know about the role of, of Algerian women um, in the War of Independence between 1954 and 1962? Um, some of you already might know a really lot about this, so I apologise, but some just some basic sort of, you know, background uh, information on, you know, how many women were involved um, and what they did. So the figure that we have, uh, the official participation figure, if you like, or how many women uh, participated in the War of Independence um, uh, between 54 and 62 is 10,949 women. Um, and that's out of a total of 336,784 combatants. That figure comes from a study um, of, from 1974, well, a study in the 1980s of files uh, in 1974 in the archives of the Ministry of Mujahideen, so the Ministry um, of Veterans. And already there's lots and lots of things that we can say about that figure. Um, firstly, there's a, a whole political context in which you may or may not be accorded veteran status in post-independence Algeria. But secondly, given the kinds of roles uh, that women play in the War of Independence, generally speaking, not necessarily on the front line of con co combat, we can also see that those are not necessarily the kinds of roles that are gonna be recognized as being worthy of official veteran status after independence. So I think we can quite confidently say that that 10,949 women vastly underestimates the huge participation of Algerian women during the War of Independence. Because this is basically guerrilla warfare and necessarily in guerrilla warfare, you have to have the whole population um, supporting you um, in order to try and overcome your adversary. So the three main sort of types of roles um, that women play are firstly, and this is the vast majority of women, um, rural women in logistical uh, support units. Uh, so these are women who cook for, um, who heal the wounds of, who hide um, sort of rural uh, guerrillas um, sort of going through the mountains. Um, we also have women in similar sort of logistical support roles um, in urban areas. This is the vast majority of women. Um, these are by far the less known women and it's even quite difficult to get images off them. This is, this is an image I would suspect that is produced by the French army um, of some rural women um, that this soldier has encountered on his patrol. We don't know, you know, if these women are supporting the National Liberation Front or not. We don't know very much about these women at all. We don't know what their names are. Um, and in sort of popular perce perceptions, this is really sort of the image of the rural women. It's sort of an anonymous mass who supports the liberation struggle, but we know very little about their individual stories. The next group of women are far smaller, uh, but their stories are much better known. Uh, so these are women um, who are actually in rural guerrilla units themselves. Um, and specifically, um, one of the key roles uh, that women play um, are as nurses, or they, they are also sometimes cooks, um, or, or they wash clothes or things like that. Um, this is a relatively small number of women. Uh, a large number of them are actually women from the city or from towns. Uh, they're urban women um, who, particularly after the student strike, May 1956, um, they join uh, the rural guerrilla. There's a lot of images uh, produced um, of them. Um, there's a few examples of those images here. These are images produced by the FLN, and we'll talk in a minute uh, about why these images are produced by the FLN. <clears throat> 
but perhaps even better known, uh, this is our last group uh, of women and last sort of type of role, if you like, of women uh, during the Algerian war, are those women who are in urban uh, bomb networks and particularly uh, women who actually plant bombs. And these are the women really whose names we know. Uh, so we have a photo here of the arrest of, of Zora Drift um, in 1957. Uh, so she's sort of a, a key member of the Algiers uh, bomb network. Uh, we have a, a painting here by Picasso, no less, of Jamal Bupasha in 1961. She's also, uh, she's a liaison agent uh, in the Algiers bomb network um, whose arrest and very brutal torture and rape becomes an international scandal. And finally, on the right, perhaps the best known woman um, of the Algerian war, who is Jamila Bouhirid, who really becomes sort of an icon sort of across, across the Arab world. Um, she uh, is arrested, tortured, put on trial, condemned to death. Um, and she again becomes sort of a cause célèbre with a campaign uh, for, for basically her, her execution not to take place, uh, which takes place, you know, international, an international campaign. And she actually is not condemned to death. Um, and we're going to come across Jumud Buhirid um, again. Now, for the French, uh, having all these women uh, fighting uh, in sort of, you know, the anti-colonial struggle is something of a shock to them. This doesn't correlate uh, with their idea of, of the Algerian woman, uh, you know, sort of who they see as sort of veiled, cloistered, submissive, not engaged in politics, not really part um, of the world outside of their home. And initially, uh, when these women here are first arrested, uh, those are, these are the first three nurses arrested in the rural guerrilla, um, the French satirical newspaper, the Canal Enchaîné, uh, reports uh, that they are actually Egyptian. Um, they can't imagine that Algerian women could sort of fulfill these roles. And this also sort of fits the French narrative in which they say sort of the uprising, the rebellion in Algeria is being sort of fomented by NASA um, and is basically, you know, part, part of uh, his uh, sort of external uh, troublemaking rather than, you know, something that, that is, has come from Algeria and has come from the colonial context within Algeria. And of course, all of these images, none of these images sort of exist by accident. Um, so what we're seeing here is the production of a dominant iconography, a dominant set of visual tropes, uh, to pick up on Kazi's words, um, and it's not, you know, very obvious, it's not sort of a random snapshot documentary account, and that's why it's so important to situate these images within their conditions of production, because they are part of the FLN's political struggle. All these images of women fighting alongside men help the FLN on the international stage counter the French narrative that they are just sort of a minority of fanatical men who don't represent the wider population. All of these images help counter the French claim that they're leading a civilizing mission and that they're modernizing Algeria, because actually what the FLN does with these images is they show that actually modernity is achieved through the anti-colonial struggle, um, through independence, and actually what the French are doing in Algeria is barbaric, and it's particularly barbaric towards women. And that's why those stories of rape and torture committed against women are also part of the FLN's political campaigning internationally, um, both at, at the UN, for example, and in individual countries uh, where there are Algerian representatives, which are indeed sort of across the globe, really, sort of by 1960. So if we think about, for example, those images that you can see on the right of the screen there, those are actually produced by an FLN team um, of cinematographers and photographers who are creating these images um, on the Tunisian border. Um, these are Algerians, some of them are French, some of them other nationalities as well. Um, if we think about this Picasso painting here, you know, getting Picasso to, to do a painting is, is not, you know, or drawing is not nothing. Um, so that, you know, demonstrates the ability of the FLN um, to actually appeal to sort of, you know, the liberal, uh, sort of you know western uh, sympathizers um, and how important that political struggle is alongside the fighting um, 
and of course Jamul Buhered, and of course we saw that in, in one of the, the films that, that you have um, as part of your exhibition. Um, you know, she, she, as I've already said, is an international icon. She gets a film made by her, by sort of, you know, about her, by the iconic, iconic Yusuf Shaheen um, in 1958. So we have this sort of iconography, which is actually really very familiar to us. And I think one of the other things that's quite important to underline is the way in which it's blurred with fictional representations of the war. And something that you will find very frequently um, is that images of women in the war um, are sometimes actually taken from a very famous film, very brilliant film, um, The Battle of Algiers by Gilo Pontecorvo, that was actually made in 1966. And Gilo Pontecorvo, he puts this disclaimer at the start of the film uh, saying, you know, all of this is, is a film. Uh, none of these are actual, you know, images from the war. But nevertheless, these images themselves have become so iconic um, that actually they're often used, including in documentaries, um, as sort of, you know, photos from the war. Um, and that has played a really important role in consolidating uh, the image of Algerian women during the war, and in particular in sort of, you know, really pushing in the foreground women who were in the urban bomb network, um, as opposed to, to women who played other roles. In particular, it, it very much sort of over, overshadows the rural struggle. Um, and that has an interesting effect too, which I'm going to come back to shortly. So what does this iconography sort of not tell us? Well, of course, it doesn't tell us lots of things. It doesn't tell us really what the FLN position is on women. FLN doesn't really have a position on women. Um, there's lots of, you know, different people in the FLN that have lots of different ideas about what role women should play in the struggle. There is a general consensus that it's important to have women support in this struggle. Um, but whether that is in sort of traditional sort of feminine roles, you know, cooking and cleaning and so on and so forth, or whether it's, you know, bearing arms in combatant roles, um, you know, living alongside men in the mountain, those are two very different things and there's very different opinions on those. Um, for, you know, more conservative men within the FLN, the presence of women in public space is a temporary phenomenon. It's, it's ne ne necessary because of the struggle, but it's not something that is ever imagined as sort of permanent. And for leftist men, it's probably very important to underline that they're not particularly interested in this question either. Yeah? Um, so, you know, there's this idea that, that the end of colonial rule will be the end of all forms of oppression. Um, so it's not necessarily seen as important to think through other forms of oppression which might exist, whether they're class-based or gender-based, because, you know, independence is going to fix everything. So there isn't an FLM position on women, even though there is the production of this image that actually, you know, post-independence, um, Algeria is going to be this sort of, you know, wonderful sort of paradise in which, you know, there's going to be equality of the sexes, um, that is mainly aimed at a certain liberal sort of Western audience. And there's actually relatively little interest as well in how women themselves relate to these images. We just see pictures of them. What do they think of them? Um, and this one of veiling and unveiling is, is, is really sort of epitomizes this problem for me in many ways. So Pontecorvo's sort of representation, he's got this very famous scene, I'm sure many of you have seen it, where women unveil in order to go and plant bombs. That is basically sort of a cut and paste. It's a cinematic reproduction of Franz Fanon's Algeria Unveiled from 1959, in which he talks about the dynamism of the veil, um, the fact that, you know, women play on the fact um, that, uh, you know, they think that veiled women are apolitical, that they're, they're backwards, they're stupid, they wouldn't get involved in politics, and they use veiled women to transport arms um, and tracts and so on and so forth. And the unveiled women uh, for the French, according to Fanon, um, are seen as just automatically pro-French. Yeah, they've modernised, they've taken off the veil, they are willing to accept the benefits of sort of French civilization. And this is what Pontecorvo does on screen. Yeah, he shows these women moving 
you know, in the very sort of Maoist way, like a fish through water because they're unveiled, which gives us the impression that these women unveiled to go and plant bombs. But actually, most of the women who planted bombs didn't wear the veil in the first place. Um, so there's quite an interesting sort of distorting effect that that takes place because of sort of the symbolic meanings that have been given to these women um, and to their roles. Um, and of course, the way in which they're read through, you know, subsequent lenses and subsequent politics of the veil, and that's sort of read backwards into the context of, you know, 1957. When we go to this photo, um, oh, this one here, uh, this photo of three nurses in, in the Maquis. So in my research, one of the things I was quite interested in was actually showing women images of themselves and seeing, you know, uh, uh, many years later, I did the interviews in 2005, what they thought of them. Uh, so this woman uh, in the sort of not very uh, good quality newspaper photograph, uh, the one on the, the, the far right, her name is Fadila Lemesli. Uh, she was a midwifery student who, who joined the rural Maquis in 1956. Um, and she talks about the fact that, you know, they knew that these photos were staged. She actively participated in staging these photos um, because they knew that basically, you know, liberal Westerners liked seeing pictures of Algerian, unveiled Algerian women carrying guns. Yeah, so they're, they're acting out this image that they know uh, is going to have a certain appeal um, to a sort of a liberal audience to basically win political support for the independence struggle. Um, so they take these photos um, and then they all get captured and the role of film gets captured with them as well. And the French army pass these images on to a, a magazine called Jour de France, um, who decided to publish them um, not to celebrate these women at all, but to point out this, this scandalous thing that's happened. These women who've received a French education have basically you know, turned against uh, the French state, they've bitten the hand that feeds them. So these images are published with the headline, uh, uh, these smiling nurses are killers. Um, and then Father Messi describes that they had quite an unexpected effect in many ways, um, because she says to me that when, uh, well, I'll quote you, um, she says, many men joined the Maquis, they joined the rural guerrilla when they saw these photos. They said to themselves, how is it that women can fight, and we are like women, in inverted commas, staying at home? And of course, she <laughs> doesn't necessarily think that fighting is an exclusively sort of masculine endeavor. But she demonstrates that she's very conscious of the fact that she can sort of play on the sort of, you know, gendered stereotypes, play on ideas about masculinity um, and play on these in order to sort of, you know, get support um, for the struggle. Um, and at the same time, she's also the interviewee who said to me that we have two struggles to lead, one against colonialism and one against taboos in our own society. And she said the second one was perhaps even more difficult. Um, so the way in which, you know, women interact uh, with these images, I think, is sometimes quite unexpected. And um, I think sometimes even images where women are seeing, you know, I remember a group of women sort of looking at a photo and they were talking about it amongst themselves and they were saying, do you remember that day um, you know, we were really crying because we've been walking in the mountains for so long, we hadn't had anything to, to eat. Um, but they don't, they're not crying in the photo, they're smiling in the photo. Um, and, but then that reminiscence was part of a sort of a very sort of joyful event in which they were remembering their time um, in the rural gorilla. So I think the different layers of meaning, the different, um, the, the meaning making sort of shifts over time and it changes depending on the context as well. And sort of that's something that, that I was really interested in uh, when I was doing my research. So let's move on to sort of the post-war period now. And of course, historians have long debated uh, the impact of women participating in wars. Does that have an impact or not on the roles that are assigned to them, on, on, their rep, on, on how they're being represented? Um, does it bring about sort of lasting structural changes um, in the dominant power relations? Does it undermine the patriarchy and so on and so forth? And um, I think basically, you know, what his, most historians would probably say would be that no, yeah, the idea that war suddenly, you know, changes all of the dominant power structures, uh, it's not going to happen. Um, but certainly um, it opens up spaces uh, for 
assigned roles and representations to be transgressed. Certainly, it was the position of the Algerian state after 1962 that the war was a turning point. And in official texts and in the presidential speeches of Bembella and then Boumediene, this is a theme that they actually repeat quite often. They say women have participated in the war and therefore as a result of women participating in the war, um, now you know, this, is, this means that you know, they can participate more um, in politics, they can participate more in society, they've proved themselves um, and, and now you know, let's include them more in sort of public space. But they actually said that quite a lot. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were particularly keen on doing things that might make that easier, like providing childcare or something like that. So it's, it's sort of a rhetorical device. Women participated in the war, they were very brave. They've won all their rights uh, that functions um, to not do anything really, because obviously independence has already solved all the problems. Um, and this kind of also links to sort of the, the socialist discourse, really, which is at the time and how that is used. Um, and because, of course, socialism solves all the problems as well. Um, but I think what's quite interesting is the way in which women who participated in the war also use exactly the same discourse. Yeah, so there's a very interesting article uh, that is published in 1963, um, in which two women, Zora Drif, um, whose photo you've already seen, and Marim Belmihoub, um, whose photo uh, is also on there, she's arrested with Fadila Mesli. Um, they basically are asked, does Algeria have a woman problem? And their answer basically is no, Algeria doesn't have a woman problem. Algeria has a problem with education. Um, Algeria has a problem with equal pay. Um, and that actually, if we address these issues and ideally address them through socialism, then there's no need to talk about a woman problem. Um, so it's quite interesting uh, sort of how that functions as an argument. Why are they making that argument? Well, you could say that, you know, they've been interviewed by a, a newspaper in a single party state. What else are they going to say? They're going to tow the official line. Um, but what's quite interesting, more interesting, I think, is the fact that they don't want to talk about the woman problem. They don't want to be seen as something sort of separate and apart and that needs to be dealt with separately. And there is a real reluctance of Algerian women after 1962, particularly that minority of women who did sort of, you know, challenge to taboos within society, challenge, you know, the, the separation of the sexes, which was a very important, you know, rule of social organisation. They don't want to be labelled with the person who's going to talk about the woman problem, the woman who's going to lead, you know, the national organisation for women. So there's a way in which speaking as a woman is delegitimised um, because of the fact um, that you have fought alongside men almost for your right to speak as a neutral citizen. But of course, as we all know, neutral, citizens, neutral citizenship doesn't really exist and the neutral is often male. Um, now, this changes um, from the late 1970s and uh, early 1980s onwards, um, and it changes in the context of sort of increasingly conservative uh, shift in Algerian society, which is embodied in many ways by the introduction of the family code, which introduces a, a very um, conservative reading um, of Islamic law, uh, which is particular particularly detrimental to sort of women's rights in marriage and divorce and, and the, um, access to their children after divorce and so on and so forth. And at this point, uh, this sort of small group of women who were in the urban guerrilla, um, who were in the um, rural guerrilla as well, they do start to develop a narrative about their participation um, and they do start to speak as women combatants and sort of appropriate that label for themselves. Um, what's quite interesting is the way in which that is framed. Um, they critique the post-war Algerian state and what they perceive to be its failings through a glorification of the war and sort of a sometimes explicitly made 
um, but implicit throughout a lot of the arguments that they're making against the family code is that um, it is anti-nationalist to be sexist. And it's quite interesting to think about how that functions as an argument and what its limitations might be, that the true veteran is a man who respects women. Um, and therefore, if you are not respecting women's rights in the post-independence period, either you're a fake veteran, um, or yeah, or you're a fake veteran, basically. Um, so there's this association that's made by these women between being a, a non-sexist man and being a true veteran. So the key thing to underline though, is that uh, women who participated in the War of Independence, who I'm going to refer to collectively as the Mujahideen, they're a symbolic resource for all different groups in Algerian society. So um, it's often said that these women are, are forgotten in the official narrative. And I don't think that's actually true because we do find them in museums, we do find them in school textbooks. People do know who some of these women are. They're presented in sort of very selective ways. The vast majority of women are not there, but that is, you know, the case of any sort of national history. It's, it is very selective, but there is a very selective place for these women in the national narrative. Um, and in particular, uh, I would say the, the state puts even more emphasis on the role of women in war during the 1990s, during the civil violence, um, at the point at which the Algerian state is seeking to demonstrate that to the rest of the world um, that they are, you know, the last bulwark in many ways against, you know, uh, violence or sort of Islamic fundamentalism. And of course, celebrating the role of women in your liberation struggle is actually a really good way of doing that. So these women absolutely sort of have a place in the Algerian national narrative. They also have a place in a feminist narrative which is constructed in opposition to that of the state and in opposition to, to the more conservative elements of Algerian society. Um, the idea that these women um, basically, you know, they fought two struggles, to quote Fadil Amisli, you know, they fought against colonial rule and they also fought against uh, the patriarchy in their own society. And they're also a symbolic resource uh, for those who contest state power more broadly. Um, so if we think about the, the Hirak, the popular movement against the political system in Algeria since 2009, um, not only is the presence of now very elderly female veterans in those demonstrations really celebrated by protesters, but their imagery is really used in those demonstrations as well. And they're seen to represent a kind of revolutionary legitimacy, which hasn't been tarnished uh, by the post-independence period in the same way that it has for a lot of the men who took political power. These women can also belong to conservatives. So in 2007, uh, I did some interviews uh, with students at, at university in Algiers. Um, and I asked them, you know, do you think uh, the Mujahideen uh, are models uh, for women today? And I just wanted to read you two quotes. Uh, one of them was, the revolutionary woman is not like the woman of today, i.e. that of makeup and exhibitionism. And another quote, there is a big difference between women today and women who participated in the revolution. Women today serve no purpose apart from destroying society, apart from, uh, with the exception of a God-fearing minority. Um, and these women are, of course, as the exhibition shows, uh, a symbolic resource well beyond Algeria. They're a symbolic resource in Palestine, they're a symbolic resource in, in Egypt. Um, and the really important thing to underline is that even though these women are being used for all different kinds of political purposes, there are some core elements to that story. Yeah? So unity of purpose, one sole hero, the people, no one should you know, put themselves ahead more than any one person, um, and that this was a just war. Um, so even though you know, these women's images is used for very, very different political purposes. There are some core elements that all of those stories share. So invariably, if you're using this story for political ends, you have to simplify it. Um, so I'd like to just sort of round off with, with a series of questions really uh, for, for us to discuss. 
Um, so one of the things um, that, that feminist movements do in Algeria, um, if we look at this banner at the bottom of this picture here, is they often position the Mujibit as part of a long genealogy of Algerian women who challenged societal oppression and expectations. So we can see some of the women here. Um, so we've got Nabila Jaheen is one of the women you can see there. She was murdered um, uh, by an um, Islamist group in the 1990s. Uh, Fatma Insouma, 19th century sort of uh, heroine resistor against the French. Hasiba Benbouali from the War of Independence. So this construction of this genealogy that then younger women insert themselves into um, of basically eternal sort of, you know, resistance. Um, and this is very useful politically for lots of different reasons, and not least uh, it enables women to, to defend themselves against sort of inevitable accusations of sort of westernization, um, because they can demonstrate there's this long genealogy of, of women um, who have fought not only to liberate Algeria, but also to liberate themselves. But then, this raises a series of questions. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about in the 1980s, this idea that campaigners against the family code use, that it's sort of fake veterans pushing this, that true nationalists are not sexists. But what about if true nationalists are also sexist? Can you be a good nationalist and a misogynist? So we can see how politically it's very effective to say actually, in the liberation struggle, men and women fought alongside each other, side by side. And actually, you know, um, this demonstrates that this is completely possible. Um, and anyone who says otherwise is betraying the values of the revolution. But then at the same time, what conversations does this shut down? How can you challenge the man who is definitely a true nationalist, but also most definitely um, a, a misogynist? And then, of course, there's a whole series of broader questions attached to this uh, about sort of the moral economies, if you like, of veteran status. Um, if your cause is legitimized um, by having these women who participated in the war at your side, what do you do when they're no longer there? And that is a real sort of generational question. What happens to these women's stories uh, when they become a symbolic resource? Is the messiness of lived experience lost? Um, and I think this is something that really came out a lot in my interviews. When people were talking about the war, when women were talking about the war, they talk about it um, in, in ways in which you can see this as a very, very messy conflict. Sometimes it's not completely obvious, you know, who the different sides are. Um, if you are a rural population, um, you know, you could actually quite easily perhaps find yourself on the wrong side of the war. Um, rural populations don't necessarily appreciate, you know, when they're actually maybe struggling to feed themselves, having a group of rural guerrillas arrive that then want feeding. So there's lots and lots of sort of nuances and gray areas um, in those stories and in lots of families, quite common in rural families uh, for someone to have someone in their family who's actually in the French army as well. This is, this is not, not an uncommon thing to happen. But then when women give the symbolic meaning to those stories, it's always very, very clear cut. It's extremely black and white, yeah? Um, we fought for independence. Uh, this was, you know, a, a just war um, and uh, we are patriots. And then we're patriots that haven't been recognized. So I think what's quite interesting is the way in which uh, women can sustain both the messiness of lived experience when they're recounting their stories, but also a very unambiguous, very black and white moral meaning uh, that they attach to it. And I think there is space uh, to, to accommodate both of those things uh, sort of side by side. Just want to read you out some quotes from Fatima Bersi. Um, who is from a little village in Kabylia. She's known locally as the leader of the Mujahidet. Um, so this is what she, she says at one point in the interview. The women who joined the Maki, they were luckier than us who stayed. They were less exposed. We were defenseless. At any moment, the French army could come, break down the door. The French came, they surrounded us, they made us come out, they smashed the roofs, and then the Mujahideen, they came and they made us rebuild their houses. We were caught between two fires. Yeah, so there we see sort of the gray areas. But then later in, in the interview, I asked her, I said, did you ever regret participating in the war? And she says, jamais, she says, never. She says it in French. The rest of the interview is in Tamazil. 
But there are regrets because the action of Algeria was insufficient. We weren't expecting it to turn out like this. There are young people who have no work. They want them to do the army. They call upon young people, but there's no work afterwards. We need to wake up. We need to revolt against injustice even now. Our country is rich, but the wealth is eaten up by those who are there in power. The cost of living is high. The man who has seven children and doesn't have a job, what is he meant to do? Let them throw the people into the sea and those who rule can stay. Um, so there we can see sort of the symbolic meaning um, and the messiness of experience that very much coexists in the, in the interview uh, with the same person. And then the final point that I wanted to make was about silences. Um, and I think this is quite an important question to open up um, in the context of, of the Stora report that was published uh, earlier this year in France, um, which is, is very much um, about the importance of talking about the past in order to, to reconcile. Um, and, you know, this, this is really sort of the product of, of, you know, many, many years of the historian Benjamin Stoua's work that he's you know, put in a report for, for the French president. Um, his first book was published in 1991 called The Gangrene, Gangrene and Forgetting. And this idea that if you don't talk about things, it becomes poisonous, um, that wounds fester. Uh, this sort of quite psychologizing idea about sort of memory and how we deal with the past that is really, really influential um, in shaping um, how certain topics uh, are talked about. And of course, one of those topics um, is rape and sexual violence. Um, and I think one of the things that emerged from the interviews that I did um, is that silence for these women, they don't necessarily consider it to be a bad thing. That actually forgetting can be a good thing, forgetting can be protective. Um, that's something that the um, ethnographer Camille Lacoste du Jardin found, you know, in the 1960s, she was, she was in the region of Cabilia talking uh, to women who had been raped. And she's like, what did you do? And we were like, well, we tried to make the women abort. And if that didn't work, we just, we just didn't talk about it anymore. Um, Khadija Adel uh, in the Ores Mountains has found sort of quite similar stories. Um, and I think the key question to think about perhaps here is who is doing the silencing? So if it's about women sort of choosing to sort of maintain composure, that actually the silencing is a way of then of dealing with sort of painful and difficult memories, then that is very different from if that silence is imposed and it's about maintaining social order. But of course, those two things intersect as well. You know, why might you choose silence? Why might you not choose silence? Um, and I think that that really comes out in the story of Louisa Ihilaris, who you see in this picture, the top picture there, um, who became very well known after 2000 uh, when her story of, of torture and rape in the French army um, was first of all, you know, across the front page of Le Monde newspaper, and then, you know, has been much sort of written about since. Um, and she has been the woman that's taught the most about sort of, you know, sexual violence and rape, um, and she's sort of well known for that. Um, and the reception of her story in Algeria has not necessarily been sort of very positive. So other women who had similar experiences to her so resent her for it to a certain extent. Um, so the idea, you know, that perhaps um, they, um, they would have appreciated if she hadn't have talked about it. And it's not just because she's talking about a taboo subject, but also because she's putting herself forward that everyone knows that she is called Louisa Ihilaris. And this sort of goes against this dominant narrative in which no one's meant to put themselves in front of anyone else. Uh, it's meant to be sort of only, you know, one sole hero, um, the people. And uh, this reminds me of an anecdote that Jamila Bupasha told me when this picture of her uh, came to Algiers to be displayed um, many, many years later, and she was invited to the opening exhibition, and she was sort of walking around, and a man sort of was next to her, and, and he said, oh, is that the portrait of Jamila Bupasha? And she said to him, no, she said, that's the portrait of the Algerian woman, woman in the war. And for her, it was a way also of putting distance uh, between, you know, this very well-known story of the violence inflicted on her body and saying, this isn't just about me. I don't necessarily want this to be just about me. And 
this portrait is actually not of me. So questions about silencing and whether you know trauma is universally experienced and responded to um, in similar in universally experienced and has universal responses, I think are very important ones to think about. Um, so I will stop there um, to allow time for questions. Sorry, I went over um, a little bit. Um, and I think sort of, you know, I've been working on this topic sort of for a long time. Um, but one of the things I think when I started out um, is it's very easy to sort of, you know, not denounce, but be a bit sort of smug and critical um, of sort of the glorification of the war um, and of women's wartime role. Um, but I think what I came to the conclusion of uh, is that it's actually more interesting if we to think about what purpose that sort of glorification serves and if you're a historian you always think don't you that you're going to be you know, analyzing stuff and deconstructing stuff uh, but over the summer my daughter had a task in which she had to you know um, research and, and write about sort of a, a woman in history and I found myself um, pushing her to, to, to do something about Fadila Mesli so first woman arrested in the rural guerrilla and you know my daughter's only 11 so I told her the story of Fadila Mesli and I told it to her in a very very simplified and metaphorical way and I told it to her as a story of two struggles um, and a story in which um, the metaphorical meaning that I hope she would take away from it would be that men who are on your side in one struggle against one form of oppression are not necessarily on your side in the struggle against the patriarchy. And I will finish now. <laughs> hey, um, I think it's my job to warm people up until um, they have questions, but please um, start uh, writing out questions in the chat and then uh, we will uh, get to them um, very shortly. Um, and it's kind of nice actually if a few of them uh, brew up and then we might be able to group them depending on, on how much time uh, we have because we don't actually have that much time left. Uh, so we'll try and be, and be quick. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to say what a treat uh, th this is, um, and thanks to to, to Katarzyna uh, Valenska for for uh, for curating this exhibit, which is is so rich. I mean, I really encourage anybody who has not yet uh, taken a good look, whether in New York or 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 on the website uh, at the exhibit. It's it's amazing series of of works. Um, and I've been interested in, in these images of, of these women and what happens to these women's lives uh, when they get mediatized, right? And what role the media and the images uh, plays in them for a while. And so when I was, when I was looking at this, uh, the exhibit in more detail yesterday, and I was trying to think of what I was gonna ask uh, Natalia, one of the things that struck me is um, how similar some of these artists' processes were to historians. So a lot of it involves um, collecting people's stories, or reworking stories that are available out there in some kind of mediated format. And then making sense of them either through collage or through some kind of remediation. Or, um, and so I guess I guess I wanted to, to start by asking um, Natalia, well, what is it like to collect these stories? You know, you did so much of this oral history, which is which is in um, Our Fighting Sisters, which I strongly recommend uh, reading to anybody who hasn't. It's fantastic. Uh, work and what's one of the, the the really outstanding things is the richness of the oral history. Um, and so, what was it like, kind of collecting these stories? What do people like talking about? What do they not like talking about? And can you kind of see, recognize bits of your process in in the exhibit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's firstly it's a very humbling experience, right? That someone sort of accepted to to talk to you and to to share share their story. Um, I mean, the, the obvious thing sort of from, from the outset is, is that that story is, is shaped by you and that, you know, you pay a key role um, in, in shaping what they're going to tell you and sort of how they're going to tell you that. Um, so when I did the interviews, I was a lot younger than I was now, which was quite an advantage, I think. I was the age of sort of their granddaughters in many cases. 
and so there was an element in which it was sort of quite pedagogical they they, they were explaining things to me um almost as if they were sort of talking to their grandchildren but also at the same time saying that these hadn't not stories that they have told their grandchildren that their grandchildren are not necessarily that interested um and so that was in, in, interesting you know for me as well to think about why people tell some stories to some people and sort of not others and I know afterwards sometimes I've been contacted by the children of, of these women who've said actually you know after you left we had a really big conversation and my mom told me things that, that you know she'd never told me before um I think the other thing sort of about collecting the stories is that I didn't want to get people to talk about just a load of really horrible things that had happened to them so you know some of them and they they did talk about um sexual violence but you know that wasn't necessarily going to be a question that i would explicitly ask them it emerged through sort of other questions and i did talk about it with Luisa Ihilaris because of course she is you know the most famous in inverted per commas person for talking about sort of rape and, and sexual violence and um she also has a training she she trains as a psychologist so there's she talks about that through her own training as well and of course that's the other thing that is really important that emerges from the oral history interviews is that all of these people are telling you these stories through everything that has ever happened to them ever since and also everything that they've ever watched on tv as well and you can really see that as well so some women when they're talking about planting a bomb what i think they're really doing is they're telling you a scene from the film the battle of algiers now is that because the battle of algiers is just a really accurate film or is it because it has played such an important role in shaping sort of dominant representations that actually there's a fusion uh between you know what people uh have experienced and and that becomes part of their memories um as well and i think that's the most interesting thing that i found these sort of layers of sort of different experiences and different parts of their lives that come together you know when they're talking about sort of specific um you know moments um in, in the war the wartime period it's never ever just about the war and perhaps sometimes it's not about the war at all um so i see that we have some some questions uh, popping up in the chat which is uh really exciting i'm just gonna um collect a few more um so in, in the meantime i guess you're interested in um so there's this distinction between the lived experience of these women during the war, which is very messy, sometimes quite contradictory, and then the way in which they were made into symbols, both at the time uh, in the FLN's kind of, uh, I don't like the word propaganda, but media work internationally, uh, and then since then, right? And it keeps on getting remade and remade and remade. And those things can seem quite separate. But I mean, I think you're interested in overcoming that distinction right between some as you say sometimes they combine the two in their story um and i do wonder sometimes if, if there's been a bit of a tendency to exaggerate the extent to which women were silenced by being made into images and so i wonder like do, do, do you encounter how much can you find uh the pleasure or the power of being made into an image of being made into a symbol of, of women sort of actively seeking that attention or seeking to control uh, the representation that is made of them and then, or profit from it in, in some way. I mean, I think sort of generally, I would say of the women that I interviewed, none of them likes being made into an image. Um, but I think that's for two reasons. So firstly, because of, you know, the strength of this idea of one sole hero, the people. Yeah, so there's something quite dangerous really about becoming sort of an individual icon. Firstly, you know, you, you're sort of breaking with this dominant narrative that there's one sole hero, the people, you're putting yourself in front of others, you're implying you did more than others. But also because of a sort of a very strong, you know, counter official history narrative in Algeria that actually the more an individual talks about the war, the less likely it is that you participated in it. Um, so that's also why it's dangerous to become an individual icon, because it's very sort of strongly ingrained, I think, in popular culture that, you know, the old boy is constantly going on about, you know, how he was under fire and how he survived. And 
he, he's probably making it up and that the real veteran is the person that never ever talks about it. So I think there's something that's considered quite dangerous about sort of, you know, becoming an icon in terms of your historical legitimacy. It, it almost works against your historical legitimacy, unless you're someone like, say, Jimmy Lubohirid, who, you know, no one could ever call that into question, right? Um, and there's also something I think about women generally being more reluctant um, to, to, you know, tell their individual story or consider that it would be important um, or consider that what they did is, is of interest to the historian. Of course, that's not sort of specific um, to the Algerian war. Um, and then also, you know, the idea of your picture being out there or, you know, being on a video somewhere, you know, particularly for older women it is, not, is not something that they necessarily sort of feel very comfortable with either. But honestly, I think the most important thing is not necessarily sort of the, the, the social context, but it's the political one. It's about the way in which the, the more you're out there, um, potentially the more you are, you're almost like, you know, thou dost protest too much. Yeah, the more you talk about it, the less likely it is um, that it actually happened. And, and that explains why women are perhaps so reluctant um, uh, to put themselves forward in terms of their story. But I do wonder if there's just as a quick kind of comment, I do wonder if there's a case where uh, people are doing it, not just women actually, like all of the people involved in the liberation struggle are doing it, but they can't say that that's what they're doing, right? So the FLN has to produce these images in order to succeed internationally, but it, and it cannot admit uh, that these are being done for that purpose because then it makes it sound fake and it's not an authentic revolutionary struggle. And in a way, I've seen similar dynamics with the Hirak since 2019, where people produce pictures of themselves, you know, in, in flags in Algiers. And clearly there's a very, uh, there's a performance, right, of this. But if you say that it's a performance that you're making these images, then it's accused of being fake and you're just pretending to be a revolution, you're not being revolutionary. So, I, I, People don't seem to want to admit that they need images of these things, but they 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 do it uh, nevertheless. But I think um, we have some really really interesting questions. I'm actually going to take uh, the one by uh, Shaista Chesti first, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, because I wanted to talk about Marc Garange's images, which I and I think you have a very very interesting question about them. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for um, letting me ask the question and for a great talk. Um, in a British context, I think mainly kind of air quotes with Western context, we're obviously not really taught too much about colonial histories and resistance and, and these sorts of things. And it was very much later in my photography life where I started learning a little bit more uh, and looking at images. And um, to cut a very long story short, Mark Garringer's work is really celebrated. And even today when I um, see that work, um, you know, people talk about how amazing it is. He was a photographer. I mean, we've got this hero heroic, idealized idea about photographers anyway, but it's like, oh, he was forced to take these pictures. So what he did was he made a body of work where, um, you know, against the will of the women as part of the process of um, identification processes that they were enacting at the time, you know, he was forced into by the French occupiers to, to make these images of women and what he did was he turned it into a body of work of resistance and that's been published and anyway I wondered if you are aware of that work and how you feel about it because as a young photographer who wasn't that well versed in histories. I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, this photographer is doing great work, bring, you know, making an important narrative be heard. But now when I look at that and I look at other images of, you know, the objectification of people and this idea of agency, especially uh, women, um, you know, of who, who basically people who are not, who have been othered historically. I, f I look at those images and I think that whenever I see them, it's a reenactment of that violence because if those women were around today, would they want their images again to be utilized in this way? Because it's usually in a gallery context or a book context. And, you know, they're, you know, Algerian women are not the consumers of these images or this work, for example. And it's highly layered and complex, but I just wondered how you feel because I think where I sit now on it is that it is a reenactment of violence and yeah, so over to you, because you've obviously been researching this a lot. 
Thank you so I much. Your question. Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Arthur. No, just a very quick mediation for people who might not know Marc Garange's uh, images. He was a uh, conscript in the French army who uh, was tasked with taking uh, identity photographs of Algerian women, and in the process, they had to be um, unveiled. And then those photographs, after he stopped being a soldier in the army, were published as kind of art photographs and enjoyed a great deal of popularity. Uh, but sorry, Natalia, over to you. Thanks, Arthur, and thanks, Shasta, for for brilliant question and contextualization of sort of the key issues at stake. Um, I think you know you're absolutely right. The issue here is is not that he's non a non Algerian, but he's in the French army, and those photos are the product of you know forcibly unveiling women in order for their identity photos to be taken, um, so that you know they can um, be you know better kept under the control and the population can be surveilled surveyed better um, by the French army. And he has had sort of a very long career sort of reinventing them as sort of a body um, of this. Distance. I'm going to be cheeky here and pass over to Kazia because she wrote a whole PhD on this and uh, she she would be a brilliant person to answer this question. Would you mind doing that, Kazia? Oh, of course. Um, I'm actually just finishing up an article on Martha Ronjac's photographs, so it's very fresh in my head. Um, but I think basically the critical writing has been very split. So one kind of um, one side says that these are photographs of colonial violence, the other one says that these are photographs of colonial res like of resistance, of the women's resistance, of their courage. And I think the photographs, you know, they can be of both, they don't have to be exclusively of one or the other, they can be about other things, they can be about, uh, you know, the rural um, urban divide, about com a specific community, about displacement, about different things. But of course, the ways in which Garanger has um, you know, published these photographs in photo books with a dense auto commentary. They have also pushed um, to the margins a lot of other really interesting photography that has been done. And there is, for instance, um, an Algerian photographer, Lassad Mansouri, who also took identity photographs during the war, saying that, you know, he did this because in his view, it was better if he was the one behind the camera rather than a French soldier. So I think Garanger's photographs have to also be put in relation to other images that we have. Um, and also, you know, the more exciting question for me is how do we view these images now? How do we show them in classrooms? You know, do we maybe want to scale them down to show them in a smaller scale? Because they were in initially very small identity card sort of images, um, which were then, you know, put up on the market and were generating profit for Garanger until his death um, last year. So this would be my response. But perhaps Natalia has also another view. I am definitely going to bow to your authority in this um, area, Cassia. I would absolutely agree with what you were saying there. Cassia, wasn't it the case that Garanger returned to uh, the same region in, I think, the 80s, right, or something like that, and then re-photographed the same woman, but this time presumably with their consent? Yes. Because uh, I, I got uh, Yes. And so they agreed to being re-photographed. They agreed to being re-photographed um, and their images appeared in Le Monde and then in another, the final photo book that Garanger published, but they are named, uh, which is different from the early photo books, um, but still their own commentaries are not really included. So it's still Garanger's kind of, um, you know, individual voice that, uh, that structures the whole photo book. But it does it, 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 no, I was no, just going to say, it sort of, it raises questions about sort of about why they agreed to do that, right? Um, so, and I think sometimes um, the, the impression that I got, sometimes um, I would be looking at photos of, women, of them that you might actually be considered sort of quite degrading and sort of recount quite humiliating aspects in their lives. And they're not necessarily reading them like that. They're looking at them. Oh, look, I was 18 in that picture. And don't I look really young and I look great. And so they're responding to them sort of in a way that that is is not how you would respond to it. But but of course, you know, we sort of project them and we frame them and we see them based on our own worldview. And they're not necessarily interacting with them um, in in the same way. And that's that's something that's that's quite important to to bear in mind. But also, you know, what are the conditions of production of that photo is? Who does he go to? With in the village, who's this fixer to speak to these women to get them to do the photo? Um, and those are all the things that we're not necessarily seeing in these photo books either. Yeah, which goes back to to to, to Shaista's um, 
point of, you know, who are these images uh, made for? And the strange thing is, in, in some of these women thought later that they were made for them, like they were one of the possible uh, audiences. But we have a really interesting question uh, from Jenny, if you want to uh, unmute yourself about the role of fictional accounts in the discussion of women's roles. And um, are you here? Hello. Um, hi, thank you so much for a really interesting talk and really interesting discussion. Um, I'm kind of just at the beginning of learning about the Algerian war and uh, writing about post-memory at the moment. Um, and so I wanted to ask in relation to your oral history research, um, do you think there's things that oral history research can provide that fictional accounts possibly can't or that fictionalized or fictional accounts provide but or history does not and um what is kind of the the line between those two things thanks so much uh, jenny for, for your great question um i actually chose my phd topic on you know women who participated in the war and what happened to them after independence um based on fictional accounts because there wasn't really wasn't a book written about it um, but I've read a very short um, a series of short stories by Esther Jabbar which was called uh, The Children of the New World um, which was so suggestive, suggestive and fascinating in so many ways about the different things um, that or the different possibilities for different women after independence and sort of what became of women who participated in the war and fiction has paid such an important role I think in the writing of post-independence history generally um, just because the fiction writers got there long before uh, the historians did and you know the same for cinema as well they they sort of they created an, an archive um, really um, where archives as we might traditionally understand it um, are still not necessarily sort of available so that fiction and, and cinema is is it's, it's impossible really to study post-independence history if you don't look at fiction cinema. You're not really going to have a lot of sources to look at, to be honest with you. Um, and I think one of the things that's, that's quite important to underline is actually some of the first accounts um, that are fictional, um, but they're about the war, are also done by women um, who are veterans. Um, so the line between those things is, is, you know, paper thin if there is a line at all. So if we think about... Um, Asya Jabbar, she does participate in, in quite peripheral way in the war herself. Uh, if we think about um, her first film, uh, La Nuba des Femmes, uh, that's actually, you know, it's about collecting the, the oral histories of, of women sort of, you know, in the mountains. Uh, if we think about Zor Zirari, uh, she's a veteran of the Algiers Bomb Network. She goes and, and does sort of a series of, you know, um, sort of short stories, film shorts, um, about um, the impact um, on families of sort of participating in the war. She also sort of publishes poems as well. Um, and I think uh, that fiction allows things perhaps to be said that couldn't be said in other forms. And, you know, until we get, you know, to the 1990s, you know, uh, we are in a situation in which all cinema cinematographic and literary production runs through the state. Um, so to a certain extent, um, there's going to be limits on that, but there's still going to be less limits on that than if you want to say publish a history book. So um, fiction has played sort of a key role uh, in, in, in recording these narratives. Um, but of course, then they need to be contextualized within their conditions of production. And I would say that is one criticism that I would make of the way in which um, Algerian cinema and literature is sometimes used by scholars, um, not pointing any fingers, but you know, cultural studies in an American or a UK university, it's taken as you know some kind of ethnographic study um, of, of Algeria at this point in time, rather than you know a work of fiction that is produced in a particular context and has aesthetic aspect, aesthetic aspects as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I, I think that, that you would always perhaps look at those things together. And one thing that I would always ask the women um, that, that I interviewed um, was, well, what have you read? Because often that was quite telling. <laughs> um, and if they'd read a lot of um, memoirs of the war, then they would structure their story in a certain way. Whereas women who were perhaps illiterate, and of course 95% of Algerian women are illiterate in 1954, 
would not necessarily structure their story as a memoir would structure it because they haven't been exposed to those kinds of frameworks and those kinds of narrative structures. Um, so it was always really important for me to understand what, what the people I was interviewing, what they had read and what they watched on TV, because you would find traces of all of those things in the way in which they told their story, they would have framed it. Um, that would become part of their own framing. Right, and we have a final question uh, by Wessila. Uh, if you are here, which is on one of the quite uh, disturbing but interesting quotes that came up in one of your interviews. Uh, thank you. Hello, Natalia. Thank you for your thought and provoking talk. I really like it. And uh, I just, um, when you read some of your uh, quotes in your interviews, uh, one statement catched my mind. So you said that the the interviewed woman said that um, the women in the revolutionary time, they are different from the ones nowadays. They have no purpose. So this catched my mind. Are these women have, uh, have another view about the nowadays or the contemporary women living now in Algeria, whether they have continuing to struggle and continue that mission of having their recognition in the society or they stopped it after the revolutionary war? What they are, what, what is their position? If the, if you have um, talked further with, with them about this issue. Hi, Wasila. Thanks very much for your question. Um, yeah. So um, that study, I should I should underline it. Sort of, you know, one quote amongst many there were a whole range of different views of sort of students um, about um, you know both women who participated in the war and women sort of in contemporary Algeria. So that student. Um, was from a young man who would, I think, would have been about 21, 22 um, at the time, um, studying history, I believe. Um, and I think, you know, that it's it's not a historical analysis of, of the women who um, participated in the war, nor is it a sociological analysis of, of contemporary Algerian society. He's just sort of using uh, a certain image of women in the war as a stick to beat, you know, young Algerian women today. Um, that's 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 really sort of how that's functioning. And of course, what he's doing there is he's he's got a very sort of simplistic reading of who these women were, because of course they're hugely sort of you know diverse group of women across social class, across different regions in Algeria, huge range of sort of you know different political beliefs, um, different levels of religiosity, and sort of so on and so forth. And actually, probably if he he met someone, you know, this is you know quite a conservative young man that basically considers that that that, that women are, are, are a problem that needs to be controlled. He would be very 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 disappointed um, because um, I don't think uh, many of the mujidet would really sort of fit his image of sort of you know the the, the pious, um, well behaved woman. In fact, many of them were, were quite the opposite. I'm thinking, for example, of someone like Zor um, who, you know, um, right up until she died, uh, she would sort of, you know, sit there smoking like a chimney, um, which I have no doubt that he would frown upon very, very much. Um, and it was, was quite well known in the 1960s that, you know, she encountered sexist behaviour in the workplace, would go around, you know, slapping her boss. You know, she, she, she is not, I don't think, the, the kind of idealised woman that she's being held up by the student to be. Um, but as I said, you know, this is this is not an analysis either based in you know history or, or sociology but it, it it functions you know as a tool of social control and that's how he's using uh, that's how he's using these women um completely sort of you know dissociated from and divorced from um uh, any kind of sort of analysis of, of sort of the facts really okay i think we've just gone uh, over time, um, and I'm sure we all have uh, various other places to be. There's a, there's a final point that I that I wanted to ask, but we'll have to discuss it some other time, which is um, the images of counter-revolutionary women. Um, so I think people confuse often um, the experience of women in the Algerian war and the women who fought for the FLN, but there was a whole other side um, 
of women whose images were, were extensively used by the French army to support the cause of French Algeria. And those images, by contrast, have were very important at the time, but have disappeared. Nobody's interested in them now because they're very toxic, right? Nobody wants to, to think about the women who wanted uh, Algeria to stay uh, French. But we'll have to, to discuss this some other time, which is a sign of a great discussion. Uh, thank you, everybody, for absolutely uh, fantastic questions, and to Natalia uh, for the talk, and to Abby uh, for, for running things in Catagena for, uh, for, the, for the exhibit. Saha Tanmir, merci. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon and evening. Um, I've put some links in the chat for more events if you would like to um, participate and kind of keep the conversation going in a way. Um, but yes, in our kind of final uh, tradition at Apex Art, we really invite everyone to unmute now and uh, get to add your thanks uh, as we close out for today. But thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much, Natalia and Arthur, for being with us. It was really a treat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye.